Good morning. This is Ron. It is Tuesday, July the 10th. Welcome to Storytime. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Again, this is Ron, your host, the only true conservative in the United States of America, speaking to all you butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. So um, 60 Minutes, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. It's a uh, news, it's called a news magazine, and uh, it's been around for decades. And I remember watching uh, 60 Minutes when it first uh, came out, and it was uh, new as far as news was concerned because news prior to that time was about um, reporters and uh, they would go out, find out what the news is, what's important and new and uh, report it to you. Come out uh, on uh, television and simply report it. Okay, this is what's going on. There's a fire over here. This are all the details on the fire, where it's located, how, what the size of it is, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then uh, in this news magazine format, they came up with something that was called investigative journalism. Um, and it was probably uh, sponsored, or not sponsored, but I mean, uh, in, um, the, uh, the idea for it came from, I'm sure, the um, investigative journalist that did Watergate, uh, Woodward and Bernstein. And uh, so they made it actually a program which, in which they basically, these news guys, uh, Morley Safer, et cetera, would go out and... Um, investigate various people and situations that were uh, fraudulent or uh, people are people are basically misbehaving in various ways and um, so they became like heroes hero journalists they were the guy the guys that sort of came to the rescue oh this kind of fraud is taking place so we went and we investigated we confronted the uh, person that was committing the fraud and uh, you know whatnot so um that gave birth really to a whole new, it seems like that's the only kind of news that goes on anymore, except for the local news. Most of it seems to be this investigative ambush journalism, go, go surprise somebody, find a public official and uh, stick a camera in their face and ask them uh, tough questions. And that's the way it is to go. But uh, the reason that it became popular was because of the advent of for-profit news. Uh, the reason that you didn't have all of that before was because of uh, television news anyways was a loss leader for the uh, networks and it was for or not for profit. So uh, journalists, uh, at least on television or news people on television, at least had the, uh, the, the only thing they were interested in was their integrity and their credibility. And uh, because that would uh, determine their ability to influence. So along comes 60 Minutes. And they uh, uh, find, a, you know, the network says, hey, this is a great way to make money. We can get people to tune in because we're creating now, not just, we're not just uh, coming out with news, but what we're doing is creating drama to go with it. So we're com- they're combining drama with news and uh, to create this investigative uh, journalism uh, format. And it was kind of exciting in, in the early days, and now it's uh, warped and become uh, basically pol- a political witch hunt, a way of going after your uh, political enemies instead of uh, going after, uh, you know, people that are, uh, well, again, just going after political enemies, w- where at least in the, when they started, they could at least pretend to be neutral, that they weren't uh, approaching this from a Democrat or Republican standpoint. Uh, they would go after uh, either target. It didn't seem to make a difference to them. And now, Uh, most of the investigative journalism is going on is being done from one particular uh, political uh, viewpoint. So, and in most cases, that's going to be the socialist viewpoint. So, um, now, uh, so today I'm going to be uh, reading the, uh, from the Ayn Rand uh, interview with Playboy magazine in 1964 and the Rush Limbaugh interview from 1993. So we'll be back in a minute. (laughs) 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, so I'm reading right now from the 1964 interview with Ayn Rand by Playboy magazine. And uh, so, and I've been providing uh, critiques as we uh, go along as to um, the mistakes that Ayn Rand has made. Because it's one of the best ways, if you really want to learn uh, what's going on as far as uh, journalists, or not, not journalists, but the left is concerned and, and their tactics and techniques, interviews, read or listen to people that are being interviewed, and it reveals a whole lot. So here, uh, Playboy, in Atlas Shrugged, you wrote, there are two sides to every issue. One side is right and the other is wrong, but the middle is always evil. Isn't this a rather black and white set of values? And it, again, there they start to, to before they had been uh, doing everything on the up and up with these questions by asking positive questions. Is this, was this, do you think? And now they're getting back into leading the interviewee and trying to lead them in a particular direction by using the negatives isn't in this case. Rand, it most certainly is. I most emphatically advocate a black and white view of the world. Let us define this. What is meant by the expression black and white? It means good and evil. Before you can identify anything as gray as middle of the road, you have to know what is black and what is white because gray is merely a mixture of the two. And when you have established that one alternative is good and the other is evil, there is no justification for the choice of a mixture. There is no justification ever for choosing any part of what you know to be evil. Playboy, then you believe in absolutes? Rand, I do. Playboy, uh, can't objectivism then be called a dogma? Um, Rand, no, a dogma is a set of beliefs accepted on faith, that is, without rational justification or against rational evidence. A dogma is a matter of blind faith. Uh, objectivism is the exact opposite. Uh, uh, objectivism tells you that you must not accept any idea or conviction unless you can demonstrate its truth by means of reason. And again, this is a, a situation where she goes wrong and actually answered the question wrong. The fact of the matter is that objectivism is dogma because it has to do with a particular theory. She also mis, um, states the definition um, that saying this is a set of beliefs accepted on faith uh, without rational justification or against rational evidence. Not necessarily so. What it is is dogma is adhering to a set of uh, standards or values that uh, for the sake of, of adhering to those standards so that you can uh, maintain your identity as, whether it's Catholic um, or uh, Christian in general or um, a particular type of political philosophy, Republican, Democrat, or in this case, a regular philosophy, in, in this case, objectivist. So, and what she should have said was that, um, yes, it is dogma. And by the way, the only thing that's not dogma is reality. Reality is not dogma. So, Playboy, if widely accepted, couldn't objectivism harden into a dogma? And again, they're, ask, they're lead, asking the leading question again. Rand, no, I found that objectivism is in its own protection against people, is its own protection against people who might attempt to use it as dogma. Since objectivism requires the use of one's mind, those who attempt to take broad principles and apply them unthinkingly and indiscriminately to the concretes of their own existence find that it cannot be done. They're, they are then compelled either to reject objectivism or apply it. When I say apply, I mean they have to use their own mind, their own thinking, in order to know how to apply objectivist principles to the specific problems of their own lives. So, and again, um, because she's created objectivism and, uh, cons and, and as her own philosophy, um, it's very, very difficult for her to uh, fend off the criticisms. It is dogmatic because it's her own philosophy. She created her own philosophy. And then uh, here, those who attempt to take broad principles and apply them unthinkingly and indiscriminately the concretes of their own existence find that it cannot be done. Uh, and she's trying to suggest that objectivism can't be come dogma. It already is. What she's describing where, where she's saying that if you're taking principles and apply them unthinkingly is it's not even principles. It is reality. You're either dealing with reality or you're not. Okay. Uh, and um, if you can, uh, so that that's the, the correct answer uh, that is that if you want to, first of all, yes, objectivism already is a dogma. Now, if she hadn't created objectivism and she came up with uh, philosophical theories 
and they want to question those theories, then you can say it comports with reality. It is true because it comports with reality. It's also known the correspondence theory of truth. Uh, what is true is that which corresponds with reality. And so she had created and been in the look, in the search for the truth, instead of searching for her own personal philosophy, it, she could have made a strong argument here. And a matter of fact, she could have made a bulletproof argument here. So, but um, because she went ahead and became subjective by creating objectivism, uh, she uh, puts herself in a vulnerable position. Playboy, you have said you are opposed to faith. Do you believe in God? Ram, certainly not. Play, but Playboy, you've been quoted as saying, quote, the cross is the symbol of torture, of the sacrifice of the ideal to the non-ideal. I prefer the dollar sign, unquote. Do you truly feel that 2,000 years of Christianity can be sum summed up with the word torture? Rand, to begin with, and by the way, so this one is, uh, again, another honest question. Okay, maybe on the tough side, but it's honest because it says, do you truly feel? Okay, instead of don't you feel that? in which you would be leading her somewhere. So when you ask, do you feel, you're, you're basically saying, I don't know. And you're telling that to the, the listeners and the viewers. And so uh, letting the um, interviewee speak for themselves. Rand, to begin with, I never said that. It's not my style, neither literally nor intellectually. I didn't, don't say I prefer the dollar sign. That is cheap nonsense. And please leave this in your copy. I do not know the origin of that particular quote, but the meaning of the dollar sign is made clear in Atlas Shrugged. It is the symbol clearly explained in the story of free trade and therefore of a free mind. Free mind and a free economy are corollaries. One can't exist without the other. The dollar sign is the symbol of the currency of a free country, is the symbol of the free mind. More than that, as to the historic origin of the dollar sign, though it has never been proved, one very likely hypothesis is that it stands for the initials of the United States. So much for the dollar sign. Now, you want me to speak about the cross. What is, the, is correct is that I do regard the cross as a symbol of the ideal uh, to the non-ideal, sacrifice of the ideal to the non-ideal. Isn't, isn't that what it does mean? Christ, in terms of the Christian philosophy, is the human ideal. He personifies that which men should strive to emulate. Yet, according to the Christian myth, uh, mythology, he died on the cross not for his own sins, but for the sins of the non-ideal non people. In other words, a man of perfect virtue is sacrificed for men who are vicious and who are expected or supposed to accept that sacrifice. If I were a Christian, nothing could make me more indignant than that. The notion of sacrificing the ideal to the non-ideal or virtue to vice. And it is the name of that symbol that men are asked to sacrifice themselves for their inferiors. That is precisely how the symbol symbolism is used. That is torture. Playboy. Has no religion, in your estimation, ever offered anything of constructive value to human life? Rand. Qua religion, no. In the sense of blind belief, belief unsupported by or contrary to the facts of reality and the conclusions of reason, faith, and as such, is extremely detrimental to human life. It is the negation of reason. But you must remember that religion is an early form of philosophy, that the first attempts to explain the universe to give a coherent frame of reference to man's life and a code of moral values were made by religion. And I wanted to point out here that, again, talking about philosophy, she gets it right here when she suggests that uh, philosophy is uh, the first attempt to explain the universe to give a coherent coherent frame of reference to man's life. That's a pretty good essence of what philosophy is. And therefore, there cannot be your philosophy, uh, your um, explanation of the universe, my explanation of the universe, and um, your coherent frame of reference for a man's life, and my coherent frame of reference. There can be theories, theories that are going to be either shown to be uh, correct or incorrect. But there cannot be just different personal philosophies. That's uh, subjectivistic and wrong. Also, on the part of the dying on the cross and the, the man of perfect virtue is sacrificed for men who are vicious. And um, again, she uses the word correctly, vicious, where it doesn't mean somebody that is necessarily bloodthirsty. That's the popular use of the word vicious. 
but vicious is re really means somebody who is uh, perpetually or uh, regularly engaged in vice, in doing things that are illegal, immoral, or unethical, and basically looks to do those things. Isn't as opposed to somebody who's incontinent, who is who is tempted to do the wrong thing and usually gives into that temptation. The people that are vicious actively look for and uh, promote and actively sustain a lifestyle of vice. Okay, so more uh, back to Ayn Rand answering the question. Before men graduate or developed enough uh, to have philosophy, and as philosophy, some religions have very valuable moral points. They may have a good influence or proper principles to inculcate, but in a very contradictory context and on a very, how should I say it, dangerous or malevolent base on the ground of truth. Playboy, then, would you say that if you had to choose between the symbol of the cross, symbol of the dollar, you would choose the dollar? I wouldn't accept such a choice. Put it another way, if I had to choose between faith and reason, I wouldn't consider the choice even conceivable. As a human being, one chooses reason. So, and again, she's getting some rather awkward questions, and a lot of it is because of the fact he's not questioning her about, you know, it's always coming back to, what she thinks, um, then would you say, instead of if she had created a philosophical theory instead of creating her own philosophy, then they would say, do I understand your theory correctly? Okay, and they would be, we'd be talking about her theory rather than talking about her. So, okay, when we come back, it's going to be the uh, Playboy 1993 interview with Rush Limbaugh. And thank you very much. Let's see. There we go. Just looking for the right, um, the right thing there. So, um, yeah, this is the 1993 Playboy interview with Rush Limbaugh. And uh, let's see where we at here. Uh, but look at the. Let me see. Where, where were we last time? I think. Oh, we was we were talking about rap and music. And a lot of this again is the interviewers like to do with when they're dealing with uh, somebody lefties that are dealing with a conservative want to do is make the conservatives look like they're contradicting themselves so that the conservative theory can be dismissed uh, outright and or making the conservative him or herself look ridiculous. Playboy, but look at the phenomenon itself. What is its genesis? Limbaugh, I think you need a psychiatrist to answer that, but I'll take a stab at it. The civil rights movement, the monolithic civil rights coalition, in this country has devastated black people by denying them the, the American dream. They have said to them directly and indirectly, it's not possible for you to survive in this country because you're black and you're never going to have a chance. The only chance you have is to let us fight your battles in Washington. So kids grow up thinking there's no hope, that they have no choice, but that they're, but they are still human beings. And the natural yearning of the human spirit is freedom. I want to be revel relevant, and I want to matter, and I want to get noticed. Everybody does. So I think rap is their way of saying, here we are. I would also venture to say that rap is founded on anger and that the anger is misdirected. So I don't know about uh, having to do a psychiatrist. I think perhaps what he's talking about or should have said was a sociologist uh, because psychiatry and psychology deal with people one-on-one. -on -one. When you're looking at groups of people and ph uh, uh, phenomenon that are affecting groups of people, then you would be looking at a sociologist. So, And then also what you got to remember when he's talking about the um, a black uh, civil rights coalition is that um, it's very deterministic. The whole idea of having a black civil rights movement is to say, is, is to put counter force in play to try to force black people to do the right thing. Uh, the suggestion is that they've been doing the wrong thing for a long time because they've been forced to by uh, a power beyond their control, and that's white racism. Playboy, many of your opinions are expressed in detail in your book, The Way Things Ought to Be, which is about to surpass Iacocca as a top bestseller in American uh, nonfiction history. 
Meanwhile, you're not the only one writing about your life, correct? Right. There are two unauthorized biographies being written. Paul Colford of Newsday has just put his to bed, and some guy at the Los Angeles Times is calling people trying to find dirt. Playboy, their interest is understandable. Your story covers such extremes of the American experience. Tell us the success story of Rush Limbaugh. How did it all begin? So uh, we'll come back to that next time. And uh, right now, it's I just, uh, again, wanted to conclude by... Um, saying, let's see, he's got um, the unauthorized biographies that are being written and, uh, you know, the price of fame, I suppose. But again, that uh, Playboy is basically trying to undermine um, uh, a Rush Limbaugh, as they do with any other. They do the same thing with um, Bill O'Reilly. And uh, and there's, these are things they're not necessarily going to do with um, people that would be like if they're, and I'm sure they have had interviews with Martin Luther King Jr. I'm sure they would take a completely different tack and, and approach with Martin Luther King Jr. But also the point of this is that it is instructive because you're going to get these uh, t- tools, technic- tactics, and techniques from left-wingers yourself. They'll uh, talk to you as though they're conducting an interview. Uh, they might ask you about Trump. You didn't vote for Trump, did you? Uh, you're not a, a, a Trump a supporter, are you? And um, that kind of thing. So, um, uh, um, so reading interviews is an excellent way of getting ahead of the game a little bit. So you you know and can anticipate uh, some of their techniques and be able uh, to thwart it. So if for instance, and a lot of what's going on, too, with people when they're coming up and asking you questions is they're simply ignoring your expectation of privacy. So uh, a way of dealing with that is simply to tell them, um, well, you know, that's really nobody's business. But now you can leave it at that. But sometimes that leaves things a little bit awkward. Um, uh, an excellent way to deal with it is say it's none of nobody's business, but let's pretend that I did vote for uh, Donald Trump. What would that mean? And dare them to draw a conclusion. Now, you would think that that would be easy. That would be a slam dunk, that they would then come back and say, well, then you suck, or whatever, and go on some kind of diatribe, but they won't. Okay, because they're all about bluffing. They want to put pressure on you, and a lot of times they do it by bluffing, trying to make you think they have information uh, at their disposal that they don't really have. And I like to call their bluff. Oh, okay, well, let's just pretend that I did vote for Donald Trump. What does that mean? What does it prove? And very often you're going to get a defensive argument from, well, it doesn't necessarily prove anything. Oh, okay, thank you very much. You have a nice day and walk away. The point is you can put the pressure right back on the lefty where it belongs. Conservatives should be under pressure to do anything. We're making the presumption for the status quo. It is the left that has to prove to us. They have to prove things to us, not the other way around. So, And when I come back, it's going to be the uh, New, York cab ci- uh, New York City cab driver's joke book. Okay, thank you very much. Let's see. Um, and this is going to be coming from the New York City Cab Driver's Joke Book by Jim Peach, an actual New York City cabbie. What's the difference between a proctologist and a bartender? The proctologist looks at the assholes one at a time. This guy walks into a bar and sits down next to a young woman. They start talking, and within a very short period of time, he tells her, I'm divorced. My wife and I just couldn't get together sexually. I wanted to try new things, the latest ideas in sexual thinking, but she was very traditional. She just couldn't get into any of the new thinking. The woman's eyes widen, and she says, that's funny. I've been divorced two years uh, from the same, for the same reason, only my husband was traditional. He didn't want to try anything new sexually, and I was always looking for new ideas, new thinking, but he wasn't into it, so we got divorced. So the guy says, hey, this is great. You and I are into the same thing. What do you say we go back to my place and get it on tonight? 
And she says, great idea. So they go back to his place and he says, okay, here's what I want you to do. Take off your clothes, climb on my bed, get on your hands and knees, close your eyes and count to six. She says, great. She takes off her clothes, climbs on the bed, gets on her hands and knees, closes her eyes, counts to six, and nothing happens. She says, six, nothing happens. She says sweetly, I'm waiting. The man then says, ah, oh, geez, I'm sorry. I got off already. I just shit in your purse. A man is standing in line behind a woman at the bank. He looks down and notices that her dress is stuck between the cheeks of her rear end. So he reaches down and pulls it out. The woman turns around and says, how dare you, and slaps him in the face. He says, sorry. And when the woman turns around again, he pushes it back in. And with that, we uh, come to the conclusion of another episode of Storytime. And until next time, thank you very much for joining me and have a great day.